King Edward VII met a tragic and agonising end on the 6th of May 1910 within the confines of Buckingham Palace. Despite his reign lasting over nine years, his lifestyle choices were far from healthy. As the successor to Queen Victoria's throne following her lengthy reign and subsequent passing, he had been the Prince of Wales for nearly six decades. Throughout his life he indulged in the high society circles, frequently visiting country estates on weekends for extravagant parties, earning him a reputation as a playboy prince with numerous mistresses. However, the consequences of his lifestyle choices caught up with him, and at the age of 68, the king and emperor of India suffered a gruelling demise. What exactly led to the king's death and what were the contributing factors? Upon Queen Victoria's death, Edward ascended the throne as the King of the United Kingdom and Emperor of India, ruling over the British dominions. He opted to reign under the name Edward VII, choosing not to tarnish his father's name out of respect. His coronation was scheduled for the 26th of June 1902, but at that time the King's health was ailing. In his late 50s, just two days prior to the coronation, he was diagnosed with a condition that could have contributed to his eventual death. Appendicitis, a perilous ailment in those days, when surgery lacked modern advancements, posed a significant threat to his life. The surgical procedure to remove the appendix was far from foolproof, carrying a considerable risk. Despite being the king, he had yet to be crowned and there was a chance that Edward VII might not survive. Fortunately, renowned surgeon Sir Frederick Trevers, an antiseptic pioneer, Lord Lister, successfully performed a life-saving operation on the king, draining a pint of pus from the infected abscess on his appendix. The procedure involved a small incision of around four and a half inches through the king's tissue, an abdominal wall. One fortunate aspect was that the surgeons determined it was not cancerous. And the day after the surgery, the king was sitting up in bed smoking a cigar. And within two weeks, he was deemed out of danger and his surgeons were richly rewarded. Edward VII was eventually crowned around five weeks later on the 9th of August, 1902. As a monarch, Edward VII took pleasure in his role within the British society and international politics. He relished the elaborate costumes and ceremonial events in which he regularly participated. He was considered a trendsetter, popularising tweeds, dinner jackets and a particular style of hat during this time. However, he also had a penchant for a wilder lifestyle and known for his extravagant breakfast consisting of an assortment of lavish foods, he indulged in opulent banquets each morning. Additionally, he maintained a series of mistresses throughout his life, indicating a strong affinity for female companionship. He famously referred to his wife as his brood mare, while regarding his mistresses as his hacks. During a wordplay on a previous monarch's name, he earned the moniker Edward the Caressa. His relationship with his mother, Queen Victoria, was often strained as she disapproved of his behaviour and choices. Despite his initial health scare and controversial personal life, King Edward VII managed to reign with enthusiasm and impact. His contributions as a peacemaker and his efforts to modernise the military remain notable, even though his reign was relatively short-lived. Edward VII's death marked the end of an era and the commencement of the King George V's reign. Although his lifestyle choices ultimately played a role in his demise, his legacy as a monarch endures. He frequently clashed with his mother during her reign as queen and she disapproved of his behaviour and numerous mistresses, which starkly contrasted the loyal nature of his father, Prince Albert. Victoria also held Edward responsible for her husband's death, as Albert had been travelling to confront him about his mistresses and philorandering. It was during this journey that Albert fell ill with a cold, from which he would never recover, 
and during his coronation, medical personnel were present to assist Edward VII in fulfilling his duties. Still in recovery from surgery, he was unable to perform certain traditional rituals that had been part of the ceremony for centuries. Throughout his life, Edward VII was an avid smoker, consuming 20 cigarettes and 12 cigars every day. He also suffered from a rhodio ulcer, a form of cancer near his nose, which was treated with radium in 1907. As his final years approached, he visibly struggled with bronchitis, exacerbated by his heavy smoking habit. In February 1909, while on a state visit in Germany, Edward experienced a momentary loss of consciousness, causing widespread panic and despite this episode, he carried on. However, in March 1910, while in France, he collapsed once again, and it became evident to many that Edward VII was gravely ill and likely had little time left. He stayed in France for a period to recover, but the true extent of the king's deteriorating health remained concealed. Some in England criticised him for remaining in France, as a political crisis unfolded back home. Six weeks later, he made the journey back to Buckingham Palace, still suffering from severe bronchitis. His wife and consort Alexandra of Denmark had been visiting her brother, the King of Greece, in Corfu, and upon her return on the 6th of May 1910, Edward VII, while recovering in the palace, experienced several severe heart attacks. The royal doctors urged him to rest and recover, but the king defiantly replied, No, I shall not give in. I shall go on. I shall work until the end. Aware that his death was imminent, he drifted in and out of consciousness, and his son, the Prince of Wales, visited him at the time and informed him that the king's horse, named the Witch of the Air, had won a race at Kempton that afternoon. Edward responded, Yes, I have heard of it. I am very glad, which is considered his final words. He lost consciousness for the last time and was put to bed. Fifteen minutes later, the royal doctors pronounced the passing of Edward VII, age 68, inside Buckingham Palace, the very place of his birth. Alexandra, the king's wife, plunged into deep mourning and refused to allow her husband's body to be moved. However, she permitted small groups of visitors to pay their respects, and on the 11th of May, the king was dressed in his uniform and placed inside a grand oak coffin. Eight days after his demise, the coffin was transferred to the throne room, sealed and placed on public display as part of the lying in state tradition. In each corner of the casket, a guardsman stood vigilantly, overseeing the body, while King George V had already ascended to the throne. The preparations for the funeral were already in progress, and upon seeing her husband's remains, Alexandra remarked on their remarkable preservation. It was observed that the king appeared peacefully asleep. On the morning of 17th of May, the casket containing Edward VII's body was placed upon a gun carriage, drawn by sombre black horses and solemnly transported to Westminster Hall. The new king, accompanied by the royal family and Edward's beloved terrier Caesar, walked behind the carriage. A brief service took place, after which the royal family departed and the doors of Westminster Hall were opened, allowing a staggering 400,000 individuals to pass by and pay their respects to the late king. The funeral ceremony was held on the 20th of May 1910 and it was hailed as the grandest gathering of royalty and nobility ever assembled in one place and of its kind the last. A royal train carried the king's casket from London to Windsor Castle where he was laid to rest within St George's Chapel alongside many other monarchs. Despite his relatively short reign, spanning less than a decade, King Edward VII was revered as a peacemaker, harbouring concerns that his nephew, the German Emperor, would propel Europe into a devastating war. 
Four years after Edward's passing, World War I erupted, and the efforts he had made in reorganising the armed forces and navy proved invaluable during the conflict. As a monarch, he surpassed expectations, yet his accession occurred when he was already beyond the average life expectancy, leaving little time for him to fully establish his reign. However, he took great care to ensure that his successor, George V, would be better prepared for the task. The king's health had been ailing, plagued by lung and appendix issues, and while pneumonia was officially attributed as the cause of his demise, it was evident that his lifestyle choices had taken a toll on his well-being. Known for his lavish parties, heavy smoking and multiple mistresses, these factors, coupled with his pre-existing health conditions, ultimately contributed to his passing. The death of King Edward VII marked the conclusion of an era and the dawn of a new reign under King George V and his legacy as a peacemaker and his endeavours to modernise the military continue to be remembered despite the brevity of his time on the throne. The death of Prince Alfred Deep within the enchanted walls of a German castle, the fateful month of July in the year 1900 cast a gloomy shadow upon Prince Alfred, the second son of Queen Victoria. Grievously afflicted by a merciless bout of throat cancer, his life teetered on the edge. Yet the cruel hands of destiny had already dealt him a heavy blow the year prior, when his young son of only 24 years old perished under suspicious circumstances. Prince Alfred, often overlooked throughout history, held the distinguished position of Queen Victoria's fourth child and second son. Though destined to reside third in line to the throne, his prodigy would ascend to become queens and rulers in their own right. However, the devastating demise of this beloved prince plunged Queen Victoria into profound sorrow, adding an unbearable weight upon her weary shoulders, for her herself would pass from this world a mere year later. Now let us delve into the harrowing tale of the tragic demise of Queen Victoria's cherished son. On a momentous day, the 6th of August in the year 1844, the Grand Halls of Windsor Castle welcomed the arrival of Prince Alfred, affectionately known as Alfie. As fate would have it, he assumed the second spot in line of succession, trailing only his esteemed elder brother, Edward VII, the Prince of Wales. In accordance with tradition, he received a regal baptism, solidifying his position as the second in line to ascend the British throne. However, as the tides of time carried on, his status waned as his brother Edward and his wife Alexandra of Denmark ushered forth their firstborn son, Prince Albert Victor. Alas, Prince Alfred would be further displaced in the line of succession, as his brother welcomed more offspring into the world. Nevertheless, during his tender years, he embarked upon a maritime adventure, setting sail in the Royal Navy at the tender age of twelve. His unwavering dedication and prowess saw him excel, passing examinations with flying colours, to become a naval cadet at the age of fourteen. His voyages took him aboard numerous majestic vessels, and he traversed foreign lands gracing them with his regal presence during official visits. However, destiny had a different plan in store for Prince Alfred, when in 1862 the King of Greece abdicated and Alfred was selected as his successor. Unfortunately, the British government intervened, opposing Queen Victoria's stance on the matter. Plans were already underway for Alfred to assume the role of the Duke of saxe coburg a vision Queen Victoria had specifically tailored just for him. Despite this setback, Alfred remained devoted to his naval career and continued to ascend the ranks. His remarkable talent for fleet management earned him high praise, with many considering him a top-notch admiral and exceptional leadership skills. In 1866, he was bestowed the title of the Duke of Edinburgh, which marked the beginning of his remarkable voyage around the globe. During his grand expedition, he embarked on a journey that took him to various countries, including Australia, where he became the first member of the royal family to grace its shores.
Alfred's presence was met with great enthusiasm and he spent approximately five months immersing himself in the Australian experience. However, amid this momentous visit, a grave incident unfolded that had the potential to claim his life and profoundly impact his well-being. It was on the 12th of March 1868, while in Sydney, that that Alfred attended a charitable event held in a beachfront suburb to raise funds for the Sydney sailor's home. Tragically, amidst the festivities, he fell victim to an assassination attempt when Henry James O'Farrell fired a revolver, piercing the prince's back to the right of his spine. Swift action was taken as six dedicated nurses tirelessly cared for him around the clock, over a period of two weeks. During the chaotic struggle, a brave individual managed to disarm O'Farrell after he continued firing at the prince. Justice prevailed when O'Farrell was subsequently executed for his heinous crime. After recovering from his injury, Alfred resumed his command of the ship and embarked on further voyages that took him to captivating destinations like Hawaii and New Zealand. His visit to New Zealand marked a significant milestone as he became the first member of the royal family to set on its shores. From there, he continued his travels to India, showcasing his value as an invaluable asset to Queen Victoria. Alfred proved himself to be a skilled and accomplished statesman on the international stage. Queen Victoria had long harboured intentions of arranging a marriage between Alfred and Princess Dagmar of Denmark, However, due to political tensions between European countries, the Queen's plans were thwarted. It was during a visit to his sister Princess Alice that Alfred encountered a fateful meeting with Grand Duchess Marie Alexandrova of Russia. On the 23rd of January 1875, Alfred exchanged vows with Maria, who held the distinguished title of being the second and sole surviving daughter of Emperor Alexander II of Russia. With their marriage, Alfred and Maria assumed the titles of Duke and Duchess of Edinburgh and made their way to London. However, their union was not a blissful one and it is believed that Alfred's wife became excessively preoccupied with assimilating into London's socialite circles, causing a strain in their relationship. Alfred's dedication to his naval career remained unwavering as he commanded various ships and steadily climbed the ranks. On the 18th of October 1887, he achieved the esteemed position of Admiral. Not only that, but he also held the prestigious role of the Commander-in-Chief of the Navy, later ascending to the rank of Admiral of the Fleet. His exceptional skills as Commander-in-Chief were widely recognised, with many considering him unparalleled in his ability to handle a fleet, implementing significant advancements in signalling and manoeuvring. Alfred's passion for gunnery was evident, and he took a keen interest in this field. Among the remarkable vessels he oversaw, one that particularly stood out was the Duke of Edinburgh's, which was hailed as the most aesthetically pleasing ship ever encountered. Following the passing of his uncle, Alfred assumed the title of the Duke of saxe coburg and Gotha. Although he relinquished his British allowance, seat in the House of Lords, and membership of the Privy Council, he retained Clarence House as his residence in London. As he ventured to the duchy, he was initially perceived as a foreigner. However, as time progressed, Alfred's amiable nature and contributions endeared him to the people of the duchy, ultimately earning their widespread popularity and support. However, a dark cloud loomed over Alfred's family when his son, Alfred, became embroiled in a scandal in 1899. Tragically, in January of that same year, he allegedly took his own life. The distressing event occurred during the celebration of Alfred and Maria's 25th wedding anniversary, but their son was conspicuously absent. Prior to the unfortunate incident, he had been under the care of the family at their residence before being sent to a sanatorium where he eventually passed away. This devastating loss undoubtedly had a profound impact on Alfred's life, casting a shadow over his emotions and well-being. Adding to the sorrow, Alfred himself battled deteriorating health, succumbing to the grips of throat cancer, and in a sudden and unexpected turn of events, paralysis of the heart seized him, 
and the Duke breathed his last breath. Queen Victoria, upon receiving the heartbreaking news of her son's demise, was overcome with profound grief and extended her heartfelt sympathy. As a testament to his memory, a memorial honouring Alfred was erected in the serene grounds of Balmoral. Prince Alfred's life was characterised by brilliance and distinction, his remarkable contributions as a member of the Navy and his unwavering commitment to his duties as a prince shone brightly. However, the untimely death from throat cancer cast a sombre note, claiming the life of Queen Victoria's second son and leaving a void that would be forever felt. Prince Arthur, Duke of Connaught in Stratham Prince Arthur was born on the 1st of May, 1850. He was the seventh child and third son of Queen Victoria and Prince Albert. The prince was baptised by the Archbishop of Canterbury, John Bird Sumner, on the 22nd of June in the palace's private chapel. At his ceremony, he was awarded his godparents, who were chosen as Prince William of Prussia, who would go on to become the King of Prussia and German Emperor Wilhelm I. His godmother was Princess Bernard of Saxe Weimar Eisnach, who was his great uncle's sister in law. His third godparent was the Duke of Wellington. This was the man that he was named after, as well as sharing a birthday with. All of the children of Victoria and Albert were under a strict education system made up of a private tutor and rigorous schedules. Arthur was reported to have been one of the Queen's favourite children. Arthur's interests were elsewhere from his studies. He was always interested in the army and showed a keen interest in joining, so it came as no surprise that in 1866 he joined the Royal Military College at Woolwich. He was ambitious and he graduated only two short years later where he was commissioned as a lieutenant in the Corps of Royal Engineers on the 18th of June 1868. A few short months later he transferred to the Royal Regiment of Artillery on the 2nd of November 1868 before going on to join the Rifle Brigade the following year in August of 1869. This was, nostalgically, his father's own regiment, and after this he went on to pursue a long and successful career serving as an army officer. His travels took him all over the world, and he travelled from South Africa, Canada in 1869, Ireland, Egypt in 1882, and to India from 1886 to 1890. While in Canada, he began training in order to defend the Dominion from the Fenian raids. As a royal member, some people were concerned for his safety, but Arthur was determined to put duty first, regardless, and therefore he put himself in arm's way, and on the 25th of May, 1870, he was engaged in fending off the Fenian invaders during the Battle of Eccles Hill for which he received the Fenian Medal. During his time in Canada, he was entertained by those highest in society, and he was invited to attend many grand balls and garden parties. Among the prestigious events, he was also invited to the opening of Parliament in Ottawa. He was the first ever royal to do this. His adventures were well documented and sent back to his mother, the Queen, to view. As well as being part of many social events, Prince Arthur was also into the Six Nations and he met with the chiefs of Six Nations of the Grand River of Mohawk Chapel in 1869. On the 1st of October 1869, he was given the title Chief of the Six Nations in Ontario, allowing him to sit in the tribe's councils and vote on matters of tribe governance. Arthur became the 51st chief on the council, despite there being a rule that only 50 can be on the council. On his mother's birthday in 1874, Arthur was made into a royal peer, being titled as the Duke of Connaught in Stratton and Earl of Sussex. 
A few years later, Arthur came into the direct line of succession to the Duchy of saxe coburg in Gotharing, Germany, when his nephew died in 1899. He decided, however, to renounce his own and his son's succession rights to the duchy, which then passed to his other nephew, Prince Charles Edward, the post hummus son of Prince Leopold, Duke of Albany. In 1878, Arthur went to visit his elder sister, Victoria, in Germany, and this is where he would meet his future wife, Louise Margaret of Prussia. Although Arthur was bedazzled by this woman, when he reported back to his mother of his interest in her, she was far from bemused. She did not want a scandal on her hands, and the princess's parents were involved in an unhappy and unpleasant marriage, and they lived apart. Not only this, she did not deem her good enough for her son, as she was very plain-looking with bad teeth. Victoria reported her dismay in her diary entries. Dear Arthur arrived and stopped with us while we were taking tea. Afterward, remained talking with me a little while and told me that he had taken a great liking to young Louise of Prussia, Fritz Karl's youngest daughter, who was brought up by an English governess. He said he did not wish to marry yet and no one had breathed a word about it, but he liked her better and better, and meant, if I had no objection, to ask to see her this summer again. I could not help saying that I disliked the Prussians, and told him he should see others first, but he said it would make no difference. She then went on to explain how his happiness was important to her, and how sad that he looked that he would not go ahead with anything without her consent. Queen Victoria therefore gave her consent and the decision was supported by Arthur's elder sister, who was overjoyed with her brother's choice. When Queen Victoria met with Princess Louise, it is reported that she began to feel excited by the pairing and it was not long before an engagement was announced. Victoria described Louise as being a dear, sweet girl of charming character and she clearly trusted her son's choice in a wife. The couple were married at St George's Chapel in Windsor Castle on the 13th of March 1879. This was also the place that four more of Queen Victoria's children would marry and is now a popular place for royals to wed. The couple went on to have three children, two girls and one boy. Their first was born in January of 1882 and she was called Princess Margaret Victoria, Charlotte Augusta Nora. This was followed the following January in 1883 with a son called Prince Arthur, Frederick Patrick Albert, before finally having their last child called Princess Victoria, Patricia, Helena, Elizabeth, born three years later in the March of 1886. His family and children grew up in the Connaught's country home, Bagshot Park in Surrey, and after 1900 at Clarence House, the Connaught's London residence. Through his children's marriages, Arthur became the father-in-law of the Crown Prince Gustav Adolf of Sweden, Princess Alexandra, Duchess of Fife, and Sir Alexander Ramsay. Arthur's first two children predeceased him, Margaret while pregnant with his sick grandchild. At two o'clock in the morning on the Saturday of the 1st of May 1920, on Arthur's 70th birthday, Crown Princess Margaret died suddenly in Stockholm of blood poisoning. Her immune system had taken a knock when she had only shortly before suffered from measles, which then aggravated her ear. She had surgery to eliminate a mastoid, and the medical world was still a far cry away from the levels of cleanliness now, and she began to suffer from pain in her face and below her eye. The doctors performed another procedure, which only aggravated her symptoms and caused a skin infection under her right ear. It took only hours for the disease to take her life, and tragically she was eight months pregnant with her sixth child. Prince Arthur, the Duke of Connaught and Strathern, passed away on the 16th of January in the year 1942. At that time, he had reached the remarkable age of 91 years old, 8 months and 16 days.
This poignant moment was made even more significant by the fact that he shared this very age with his elder sister, Princess Louise, Duchess of Argyll, who had departed from the world just two years and one month earlier. In honour of the Duke, a solemn funeral service was conducted at the prestigious St George's Chapel, which stands majestically within the historic Windsor Castle. This service took place on the 23rd of January, providing an opportunity for the family, friends and dignitaries to pay their respects. Following the service, the Duke's mortal remains were temporarily interred in the Royal Vault, located beneath the hallowed grounds of St George's Chapel, a place of immense historical significance within Windsor. However, this was not his final resting place, and on the 19th of March 1942, a poignant and dignified ceremony saw the Duke reburied in the Royal Burial Ground at Frogmore. The serene and picturesque burial ground has been the final resting place for many members of the British royal family. Prince Arthur's passing held special significance in the history of the British monarchy, for he was the last surviving son of Queen Victoria, who had reigned over the United Kingdom for an unprecedented 63 years, with his passing a direct link to one of the longest and most transformative reigns in British history, came to a poignant end. As is customary, the Duke's will was sealed following his passing, a practice that helps maintain the privacy of the deceased's personal affairs. It's worth noting that the estate he left behind was valued at £150,677. When adjusted for inflation to the year 2022, this would be equivalent to approximately £4.9 million, a testament to his lifetime of service and dedication to the Crown and his country. Please continue to support my channel by subscribing. Of all of Queen Victoria and Albert's children, several historians believe that her youngest son, Prince Leopold, was the cleverest and the most interesting of all of the young royals. His short life was full of intrigue, drama and a danger that was at the very heart of the British monarchy, despite him never being able to see the British throne. The eighth child and second youngest heir of the reign in Queen Victoria and her husband Prince Albert, little Leopold came into the world as something of a medical marvel. Queen Victoria had given birth eight times and she controversially used chloroform as a form of pain relief, which went against the status quo of the public at the time. It was a Christian belief at the time that women were supposed to suffer in childbirth and if they interrupted this natural way of things, there might be divine consequences. Leopold came into the world happy and seemingly healthy and the palace were full of relief. However, this relief did not last very long, as his health took a decline over the years. Victorian concepts of parenting are a lot different than our own today, but the royal household of Queen Victoria was bizarre by any standards. Victoria had outwardly reported how much she despised being both childbearing and large parts of child rearing, despite having a large brood of nine children running around. As the eighth child, Leopold was often forgotten, and the impact of his birth on his mother may have led her to suffer from postpartum depression. And Leopold's father, Albert, wrote in a letter not long afterwards about Victoria's continuance of hysterics. Victoria played her children off against each other, and one way to do this was to put forward her favourite child over the others. Her alleged favourite was Prince Arthur, who she told her husband Prince Albert that out of all of her children, Arthur was dearer than any of the others put together. Leopold was always known to be a sickly boy just like his father. He suffered greatly with anxiety which led to a number of physical problems, such as indigestion, and no matter how much the palace fed him, he remained rail thin and weak. When he was a growing toddler, he started moving around, and he would bruise very easily and suffer major injuries at the smallest of falls. 
It wasn't long before Victoria and Albert searched for answers and came to a disturbing conclusion that his illness was a fatal one. A dark secret clouded the royal family whereby the males born to the many match-made couples that descended from Queen Victoria would suffer from a genetic disease called haemophilia, which prevents blood from clotting properly. Victoria had passed this on to her son, and suddenly, the prince's dangerous falls and sickly disposition made all too much sense. Unfortunately for little Prince Leopold, the dangerous impacts of haemophilia manifest in men and not women, and it was soon very clear that the princeling was in fatal danger at all moments of the day. Victoria did worry constantly about his internal bleeding, and nobody believed that he would survive into adulthood. As well as this condition passed from his mother, medical professionals also believed that the prince was suffering from another illness. Leopold would suffer from fits, which led them to believe he had epilepsy, which at the time was a sign that he was cursed or bewitched. The family did not deal with his depositions very well, with his mother taking full control over his life. Queen Victoria was very protective of her son, and she kept him practically under lock and key, and from the moment he could crawl, he had a whole team of doctors constantly checking up on him and making sure that the royal didn't have a hair out of place. Leopold was only eight years old when his father died in 1861. Albert was only 42 when the Grim Reaper came knocking and his passing through Queen Victoria into a notorious state of mourning. Prince Leopold had not only inherited his sickly disease from his mother, but he had also inherited her looks. His wide, heavy-lidded eyes, the set of his small mouth, and his oval face as well as Victoria's light hair. As a male member of the monarchy, it was tradition for the princes to form part of the military, but due to his condition, his mother banned him from all military service, excepting some honorary positions that were merely symbolic. All of his brothers went on to have some form of military service, which must have been bittersweet for him to witness, and a massive downer to his ego, and something that likely humiliated the young Victorian man. So something had to give. Leopold could not be physical in any way, and so he turned his attention to his mental capabilities. The prince had the best tutors royalty could buy, but no less than the poet Laurite Alfred, Lord Tennyson noted the boy's quick mind and immense capacity for learning. Despite being academically bright, this did not rid him of his rebellious nature. As a teenager, he began to grow tired of his mother's watchful and overbearing eye, and so he became a college boy. He had to beg and plead with Queen Victoria to let him attend the University of Oxford out in the world. Victoria finally relented when he was 19, and Leopold got a tiny taste of what independence felt like. Still feeling constrained by his mother's watchful eye, Leopold went to drastic measures to win his full freedom. He made the decision that getting married was his only hope of getting out, and he started his quest for a wife by looking around Europe for a royal bride. As a Prince of England, Leopold should obviously have no trouble at finding a wife, right? His secret illness was no longer a secret, which meant that unfortunately for Leopold, he wasn't exactly the most eligible bachelor. As a result, he went through a painful number of options, including the heiress Daisy Maynard and Princess Frederica of Hanover but all of them rejected him for one reason or another. Then his meddling mother got involved in the matchmaking process and set him up on a blind date. She was actually extremely good at her matchmaking and after watching him fail over and over again, 
she soon suggested that Leopold meet up with Princess Helena, the daughter of a German prince and one of Leopold's distant cousins. The German princess had a bad reputation in England for being frigid and distant, but the truth couldn't have been further from this gossip. She was the exact opposite. She loved being among the people. Helena was also very beautiful, and therefore she was absolutely perfect for Leopold. Princess Helena was, was unusually and shockingly educated for a woman of her time, and she could compete with her match on an intellectual level. She loved math and philosophy, and Leopold was impressed with her. He was completely delighted with her, and he even introduced Helena to his academic circle of friends from Oxford. Obviously, Helena impressed them mightily, because she continued lifelong friendships with the group. Leopold had a lovely, extravagant royal wedding, as you would expect for a prince of England. He didn't wait around, and he jumped right into matrimony with Helena, marrying her on the April 27th, 1882. He was 29 years old, and she was eight years his junior at just 21. The wedding was a royal fairy tale. Helena's train was a full six yards long and embroidered in silver. The service was performed by the Archbishop of Canterbury. As a nervous groom and as one who was not used to the giant public displays of affection and publicity, Helena was clear and confident with her vows, but this cannot be said for Leopold. He mumbled his way through the service with not so distinctly audible answers. Unlike many of the arranged marriages of the past, especially in the royal family, Leopold did well to find true love with Helena. It has been reported that their marriage was blissful, with the married pair complimenting each other well. Leopold was just happy to have gained his independence from his mother, finally. They went on to produce children, and only a year later, his wife gave birth to his first child, Princess Alice, in 1883. Leopold was living with a curse, and he would pass his disease on to his daughter. As a female, she would not see the impact of haemophilia, but she would go on to become a royal carrier. Determined to grow their family, only a year later, the pair would go on to become pregnant again in 1884. They were in the prime of their lives. They were enjoying family time together with their daughter and their baby on the way. They envisioned a long, bright future together, raising little royals for Grandma Victoria. But unfortunately, Leopold's body had a different plan in store for him when it began to fail him. Leopold was approaching 30, but his royal blood disease was beginning to cause him joint pains during the cold and wintry English winters. His doctors urged him to seek better climates abroad away from his pregnant wife in Cannes, but this would be his ultimate undoing. Leopold was part of a large brood and he particularly was close to Princess Louise, who was Queen Victoria's sixth child and only five years older than Leopold. Louise was the rebel of the family and when Leopold was still a child, she set him a particularly bad example when he was caught up in one of her scandals. It is rumoured that Princess Louise began an affair with Leopold's tutor Walter Sterling, before falling in love and creating a secret love child that would be brought up by a non-royal family. But this was never proven. Leopold was only 14 years old at the time, but he already knew which side he was on. Leopold did not portray a rebellious boy, but he was a geeky guy with a cheeky side. When Queen Victoria dismissed Walter Sterling from royal service, 
Leopold still kept up a secret correspondence with the man. Despite living a marriage of bliss, it has been alleged that Leopold may have been set to marry another woman called Alice Liddell. She was the real-life inspiration for Alice's adventures in Wonderland, with some even suggesting that he named his daughter Alice after her. But others allege that he was not in love with Alice, but instead he was in love with her younger sister, Edith, who was closer to his age. Alice served as a secret smokescreen for Leopold's undying devotion to Edith. If he was so in love with Edith, why did he not go on to marry her? The answer is a heartbroken one. In 1876, when Leopold was failing in his quest for a bride, the young little girl died from measles or periontonitis, which is inflammation of the abdomen. Leopold played his part in her funeral with a touching display of affection when he helped carry her coffin into the funeral procession. Queen Victoria lived in fear that her precious boy would be suddenly taken from her, and so she was overbearing and protected of him and his health. But as the years went on, she enjoyed the control she had over him and the fact that he relied on her so heavily. He was kept at her side, just how she liked it, before giving him a promotion to handle her affairs. When Leopold was a young adult, he became Queen Victoria's personal secretary, an unofficial position that his father Prince Albert had mostly held before his untimely passing. In some ways, Leopold's meticulous mind was ideal for this position, though it also pushed him to be concerned with court interests, something he was much less interested in. Leopold was a smart man. His time at Oxford was some of the best years of his life, where he made lifelong friends. He clinked glasses with celebrities like Oscar Wilde, John Rusking and Lewis Carroll. While these were socially acceptable activities for a royal prince, he was also embroiled in a secret society that his brother introduced him to. The future King of England, Edward, who was notorious for his debauched behaviour and scandals. He was introduced into the notorious secret society, the Freemasons. Leopold was no lonely rank and file either. After all, Albert Edward was a worshipful master and the most senior member of the Oxford location. Following the advice of his doctors, Leopold left his pregnant wife behind to travel to, in February of 1884, in the hope to reduce his haemophilic symptoms. He was staying at the lovely Villa Nevada residence. He had been there for a month when disaster struck. While in his villa on March 27th, he slipped and fell. This should have been a minor ordeal, but due to the prince's blood clotting disease, when he hit his knee and banged his head, it was catastrophic. The prince had been reminded of the dangers of hurting himself and how the tiniest of bruises and bang-ups could lead him severely injured or worse, and for good reason. This fall was devastating to the royal. His condition worsened over the coming hours until in the early morning of March 28th, the prince never woke up. The culprit behind his untimely end was gruesome. He had done well to avoid this level of injury throughout his life, but his luck had finally run out. This small bang to his head had led to a fatal cerebral hemorrhage, which led to his death. In his tragic wake, he left destruction when his mother mourned him deeply. When Victoria heard of Leopold's passing, her response was absolutely heartbreaking. She had already suffered the loss of her dear Albert, as well as Leopold's older sister Alice, and she was beside herself with grief and loneliness, as she wrote in her journal. To lose another dear child, far from me, and one who was so gifted, and such a help to me, is too dreadful. 
Then his wife was left alone, still pregnant at home and full of grief. She gave birth to the son he would never meet in that summer, Charles Edward, who would never know his father. His deadly disease was luckily not passed to his son, but that didn't mean that his family was safe. Leopold truly may have been cursed, and the curse did not end with his death. In the years after his death, his children and his wife suffered heart-wrenching fates. His first daughter Alice passed her haemophilia genes on to her eldest son Rupert, who then went on to die at the young age of 20 in a car accident, an event that his illness surely made worse. Yet Leopold's own son did more damage to his name when he lost his way. Growing up without a father figure is difficult, and little Charles Edward needed some guidance in his life. The man was not plagued by his father's royal disease, but he was plagued with the extremist ideologies when his son turned into a Nazi sympathiser, fighting on the German side in both World War I and World War II, before the English government stripped him of his titles for his participation. He became estranged in 1954. Charles Edward passed away while living in poverty. Leopold was the first known male royal in the British line to suffer from haemophilia, but he wasn't the last. The tragic tale of his legacy is infamous. One of Victoria's granddaughters was Princess Alex of Hesse, who was also a carrier of haemophilia, and she became Alexandra, the last Tsarina of Russia. Alexandra ended up passing on her haemophilia to her firstborn son, Alexei. Alexei's haemophilia was severe, and his mother grew desperate, even seeking the controversial help of the dark holy man Rasputin to save Queen Victoria's great-grandson. This, as we know now, was one of the matches that lit the Russian Revolution and eventually toppled the Russian royal family.